the talk. And thank you as well for the opportunity to do this fellowship. Um, and I also want to, at the start to take the opportunity to thank a lot of the people who you don't see on these videos and up front who, who make these things happen. It's been a great experience being a part of the Carson Centre and not just uh, the fellows has is, is made that um, the uh, experience that I'm really uh, valuing right now. Okay, so I'm going to talk just now about community low carbon transitions um, and I am here during my fellowship to write my first book uh, around uh, the way community values, it uses and uh, relates to the environment. Over about 10 years now of career, I've collected over 20 of these examples, different types of communities, um, and then different ways in which they do these things uh, relating towards the environment. I'm going to try to get through three of them today. Uh, so it's very partial. I mean, these are very small scale particular examples, uh, and I'm only choosing three of what I've been uh, experiencing in the last uh, 10 years as a researcher. Um, and then at the end I'm going to try to weave together some discerning uh, patterns that I can find uh, from these examples. Okay, so I'm going to dive in and start with uh, community number one. It's 2008, you live in this street, which is in Edinburgh, in Scotland. You're getting increasingly concerned about the environment and the global challenges that are facing uh, not just you, your street, your children's future, but the world at large. You decide to do something about these challenges. You have conversations with neighbours, you get together and think, uh, we need to act, we need to do something, as a participant told me. So, uh, you start by putting uh, posters up and saying, anyone who's interested in environmental issues, meet at uh, this pub on this occasion and let's just see what happens. And so they met, the meeting went very well, and so they decided that they would start showing environmental films and reading collectively uh, environmentally in, uh, in, informed books. So they started to do this, and then they wanted to do something, get, get involved, start taking actions. There was a piece of vacant land which was owned by the hospital nearby, and so they started their own community garden. And as they went on, this is maybe three years into the process, um, they decided, they heard about a government scheme that would give them money to be a bit more ambitious, to realise their ambitions, and so they applied for the money with a proposal to retrofit this street here, this is the same street, uh, with the latest environmental efficiency technologies, and take practical action rather than just reading books or watching films or being uh, generally interested in environmental issues. They got uh, £79,500 from this particular scheme, uh, which for an uh, 18 month project is quite a lot of money. They were able to hire two uh, full time staff workers and had a rolling program of interns, which uh, the max was about six interns. Uh, the, the scheme was very successful. Uh, and it was successful on the terms of the report they put back to this funding scheme. So this is the, this is the data, very, diffi very difficult to measure the carbon savings from different behaviour of change or uh, technological technologies that you've installed um, measures, so they have a lower and higher estimate. Nevertheless, they were able to claim significant uh, carbon savings from this particular part of their community action. So, great, successful use of community to the rescue, leading, uh, leading the charge towards a low carbon future. Well, except by this point, the group had become quite fractured and internally the relationships were really frayed and had gone from being uh, very positive, people uh, hanging out with people they liked, with their neighbours, feeling that they were doing something under their own steam, to being quite uh, antagonistic uh, with one another. People would say things to me like, why would I do this when there's someone paid to do it? Um, and so the introduction of uh, the, this funding scheme, or the, the um, achievement of success for this group, was quite detrimental to the relationships, the interpersonal understandings within this particular group. Okay, 
Community number two. Imagine you live here. This is a different neighbourhood, but again in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, and you are concerned, or you and, and a number of your fellow neighbourhood residents get concerned that there's a proposal to put a, a new superstore uh, right next, in your neighbourhood, right next to your uh, local uh, high street, which is a lot of local um, shops and suppliers. So initially, this started uh, as a community action, very much focused on economic concerns rather than environmental concerns. So again, very similar to the first group, uh, they, they would tool themselves up. They would read, they would learn, and they would meet together through uh, the process of learning what they could do uh, to achieve their particular aims and objectives. Uh, the kind of reports they're reading at this time were things like the New Economic Foundation's Clone Town Britain report, or George Monbiot's Captive State, the corporate takeover, corporate takeover of Britain. They had to learn quite a lot about the planning process and so the ways in which they could stop the supermarket being built was to um, uh, lobby the council to refuse planning permission for this superstore. And they were successful. So again, another successful use of community uh, meeting the demands of local people uh, they were able to stop planning permission being granted for this superstore. And they branded themselves very well with bags such as this, where people go around and say, I'm a local shopper, I go down the high street, I use the local uh, shops. But what did they do now? They found out they quite enjoyed meeting the people who were in this campaign with them. They had made new friends. They enjoyed being with people who they would say, it's a bit like swimming with the tide. There's an easiness to the relationship. That the whole community was brought together for a common purpose, which was now no longer there. They had succeeded, so what did they do next? So they adopted um, what at the time was quite a popular um, uh, model of community based activism, which is called the Transition Town Movement. I'm not going to talk about them, but as was mentioned in the introduction, this is a model that I can explore or explain in the questions. Um, and this focused not only on uh, the relocalisation of economic relationships, which is their initial concern with this group, but also uh, doing something in the face of global environmental challenges. And so they put together, this group was in need of something else to keep the community together, to, to coalesce around, and they put together this proposal to have uh, this wind turbine uh, here, which is about a picture of it, which would have been Scotland's first ever urban community owned wind turbine on the seafront uh, next to uh, sewage works. So, land was perfect, what's not to like? But again, the, the problems with the planning process, the, 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 the skills that they learned from dealing with the planning process with the supermarket, it was not as simple as that, and you could throw spanners in the works, which other people did. And so the planning was refused. They then shifted focus towards uh, putting solar panels on the roofs of the local municipally owned bus company, which is nearby. Uh, again, that didn't work for various reasons. The key point in this picture is the, is the top left corner here. I don't know if you can quite read it, but it's a predictive view. Because this turbine was never actually built. Um, it, didn't, it didn't work out. But again, the community needed something to coalesce around, it kept shifting focus, even migrating from economic to environmental concerns, shifting from where this particular renewable energy project would be built. And eventually they settled on this um, uh, plot of land up here, which uh, for anybody who's not a geographer, this is not an urban environment. Uh, there's trees there and then some kind of heather, heather land. And it's very far from where this community initially was forged, formed and forged in a uh, suburb of Edinburgh. And so the, community, the wind turbine is actually here, the south of Inverness, about halfway across Scotland. Uh, according to this map, it's 257 kilometres away. Uh, so for me this is fascinating conceptually, what this is doing about the displacement of community activity, and especially as a geographer, the core themes of space, place, scale, and what's happening here about community action. Community number three. Again, 
based in Edinburgh, uh, but this time this is Victoria um, Key, which is where the civil service of the Scottish Government is based, and most of the civil servants work uh, and operate. And this type of community that I'm talking about here is slightly different to the first two, although they are all interrelated in some sort of sense. And uh, in order to meet the Scottish Government's quite ambitious carbon reduction targets, uh, the new SNP administration, as it was then, introduced a, a government policy which would fund community-led responses to um, the climate crisis. And so this is the scheme, this is a scheme that funded both of the previous communities that I've talked about. The scheme is called the Climate Challenge Fund, or CCF for short. And there's numerous, because it's government policy, there's lots of um, uh, politics behind the introduction of this scheme. But suffice to say, it also had, on the surface, the exact same faith and belief uh, that community-led responses to environmental processes were not only um, possible, but preferable. This was, this was a way forward, and a way that was effective, cheap, by government standards, um, and uh, could achieve quite a lot. But the process of going through this form, because um, the, uh, so in the, first, in the first tranche of funding, over, over three years it had uh, 27.9 million pounds of funding. So that gives you an idea of the scale. So in terms of the community groups who were funded by the scheme, this is game changing. This is a large, significant amount of money. In terms of government funding, it's actually quite cheap. It's not that big a deal when it comes to the Scottish government's finances. Uh, but, because, so, but because they're spending government money, because they're spending taxpayers' money, they, uh, there are companies that have legal and fiduciary requirements to, to spend that money well and effectively. They can't just give money to whoever they like. And so this is a snapshot taken from the, um, the, uh, the documents that, were, that are there for any community group who, who can apply for this money. So this is money that local authorities can apply for. Existing environmental NGOs, like Friends of the Air Scotland, are not allowed to apply for it. It's only for genuinely grass grassroots community groups, like the ones I previously uh, mentioned. But this process of proving that you can effectively and responsibly spend government funds formalises and institutionalises forms of interpersonal relationships that changes what it is to be related one to another. But it's neutral as possible. Um, and also, because you're spending government money, you need to demonstrate that you are doing that effectively. And so, uh, this is an extreme example, but this is a genuine example of how the groups had to report on their uh, the bang for their buck. How much carbon have they saved per uh, pound of uh, funding received? Now. There's a lot of intelligence in the room. I don't know how many people could do this quite easily. But this is, um, there's, there's, there's a justice issue about who can and cannot apply and get access to this money, even though in principle it's open to everyone. And crucially, there's the um, demonstration requirements that not only are you going to do what you said you were going to do, but to demonstrate that you've done what you said you were going to do. And it's the demonstration requirements that changes your relationships to the task, the activity that you wanted to carry out. And of course, because to do that in a, in a document, uh, it's easier to, to, find, uh, to find a number, a number like kilowatt hours uh, that you have, uh, that you've uh, lowered in terms of the energy efficiency of the building, say, in the first example we talked about, uh, or the classic example is the carbon footprint. Measurements. Okay, so those are three uh, vignettes, three stories of three different ways in which communities use to pursue low carbon transition, uh, pursue a uh, 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 more positive environmental future. What can we discern? What are the patterns that are there that lie beneath these um, examples? Community is not a simple thing. It's used in quite an everyday sense, 
But the community is uh, plural in the sense that there are multiple different forms of community that are used in this regard. But communities are also multiple, so even from within it, one particular view or vision of that is not uh, unified, is not necessarily the same. And there is also, to community, something of a, a beguiling quality that you're never quite able to grasp exactly what is going on there when you think about collective subjectivity. What it is, this form of togetherness that goes under the name community, what exactly is going on there, has a real beguiling quality. And so that's really interesting when it is used in quite an objective and formalised, institutionalised way in documents like community policy. So one of my arguments is, is that community policy counterproductively uses and degrades community action. On the surface, they are using exactly the same terminology, this exactly the same belief in the power of community. But what they mean by that in terms of how it's used, how community <coughs> has quite different outcomes and consequences. And so this is an important realisation to hold on to. And what I want to build towards is a theory of what I'm calling crowding out community. So the crowding out theory, very basically, is that intrinsic uh, motivators for action, such as belonging to a community, such as feeling passionately that we need to do something on environmental issues, are crowded out through instrumental forms of reasoning, such as demonstration requirements like a number. And so that's a kind of reasonable take, I think, on what's going on here, that we can that community policy is crowding out community action. The more interesting question for me is how. And I think it's going through in four ways. And I'll, I will end on these four ways. The first is through meaning. By fixing meaning, by introducing a sense of fixity to what this phenomenal interpersonal understanding is, this beguiling quality to community, we are taking away something of communities on the move, lived, embodied quality. The second is through uh, visibility. And by visibility, I don't just mean what we can see through our eyes, but there's something that is pre reflective and pre conscious about belonging one to another that can be taken away or eroded through making that uh, visible. Think about relationships you have with somebody who you've never once discussed rationally or consciously what exactly is going on in that relationship. To do so is to fundamentally change that relationship, at least for the moment you talk about it, and make it visible in a metaphorical sense. There's also something going on around the, what's happened to subjectivity, and here I'm really trying to get at the notion of collective subjectivity. Um, community action is much more of a verb. It's a doing, it's a getting involved, and it's about uh, a participation. Community policy is, is more of a noun. It's about objectifying, and about uh, distancing, in a Heideggerian sense, um, what, how one can describe and attribute qualities to an object that we call community. Community policy here is about containment, ascribing containment to a particular group of people. Community action, by contrast, is about involvement, an entirely different form of subjectivity. And lastly, and this is not us, uh, it's hardly uh, a hot take on this matter, uh, but there's something about the way in which numbers are used throughout each of the processes I've described, uh, which crowds out a lot of the community. Now my argument is not to say, okay, community action good, community policy bad. It is rather to say both on the surface, ostensibly, want the same thing. How can we bring these two into a more healthy conversation with one another to help both achieve the aims that they wish to? My argument is not that community policy is inherently coercive, but rather it is counterproductive to the aims of facilitating community action to achieve the environmental challenges that we face. Thanks.